All right, crazy kids. Yeah, I'm usually talking about you, Sam. Come here, Sam. Oh, come here, Sam. Oh. By the way, Sam says hi. And here's Lily. Lily? Hi, baby. All right. Okay, so we're doing uh, Federal Courts Part 2 of 2. Nice circle, Lily. Um, uh, so, um, step one in this second half of the lesson, go into Google Classroom to our class. AP GoPo, <coughs> in the classwork section, look at info on the modified AP exam. Open that, please. And then click on this picture which is uh, the summary of the topics that are covered in Units 1, 2, and 3, which will be on the AP exam, the modified AP exam with just two free response questions, all right? So go do that. While you're doing that, I'm going to pull it up myself. All right, so here we are. So this is what is going to be covered on the AP uh, exam. There's going to be a free response question. Uh, there's going to be two of them. One of them is going to be an argumentative essay. I strongly believe the argument essay will focus on unit one. Uh, it, I believe that because the argument essay um, uses the nine foundational documents and those are covered mostly in uh, unit one and then we get into the Constitution itself in in unit two alright so we are doing a lesson on the federal courts so let's look I want you to look down this list and see how many of these uh, topics are um, cover are connected to the courts all right all right so let's go and look down and <coughs> we have a bunch the judicial branch legitimacy of the judicial branch ah Griswold, Roe versus Wade, judicial activism, the power of the court, whether the court is a dangerous institution, Federalist number 78, right? The court in action. Uh, <clears throat> checks on the judicial branch. Um, okay, bureaucracy, bureaucracy, bureaucracy. Policy and the branches of government. A connection between the judicial branch and the legislative branch, uh, which would be what? Ruling laws unconstitutional and judicial review. <laughs> Sam's playing with the I'm sorry, baby. Come here, come here, come here. Come here, come here. No. I'm going to put that up here for just now. All right, leave it. All right, that would be judicial review, right? Striking down laws of Congress and uh, the connection between the president and the courts, which probably is gonna focus on the nomination confirmation process. Although that could also um, deal with um, uh, ruling executive actions, executive orders or executive agreements unconstitutional also. All right, so um, we are now going to go, now go back from this and open up the PowerPoint that I have attached and go down to um, AP issues. I'm gonna ask you to pause the video right now and get in your constitution and read two clauses, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, two provisions. Um, Article two, section two, paragraph two, and Article 3, Section 1. All right. 222 two, two, and 3 1. Stop and go and reread those. All right. While I pull up the PowerPoint. All right, all 
of these are either tidbits or possible main focuses of a potential free response exam. Okay, so AP issues involving the nomination and confirmation process. Remember, the Senate confirms presidential nominations by what percentage? Ah, by what percentage? Good. Um, by a simple majority, 50 plus, or you can say 51 when it comes to the Senate. All right, so the president, there is an opening for a district court judge in the District of Arizona. Who is the president going to nominate for to be a new district judge? Somebody retires or dies, there's a new opening. Who is he going to nominate? Well, who had he better call? Who had he better call? He had better call the senators from that state and get names from them. Um, now, there are some politics in this. If you are a Republican president, you're probably going to call the Republican senator uh, over the Democratic senator. But you're going to, um, if you open these two links, particularly this one, and go down to the Senate, it sounds like um, a presidential nomination will be in deep trouble if both senators do not agree, even if they are from separate parties. All right, even from separate parties. But in general, for the purposes of AP, this is called senatorial courtesy. If you are a president and you are going to nominate a federal official who is going to be in that state, the uh, perfect example of that is a federal judge. Um, the other one would be the U.S. attorney for the District of Arizona. But you had better call uh, the senators from that state. Uh, <clears throat> You don't have to get this deep, but it's interesting. If you read, uh, if you read this and this, they'll talk about this idea of a blue slip. Um, in in this Wikipedia article, they talk about the history of the significance of blue slips. Uh, but basically, a blue slip is where a senator can say, "I don't like this guy." <clears throat> um, in the old days, that was it. The who runs the, first of all, what committee is going to be hearing these judicial nominations? The Senate Judiciary Committee. And who controls the Senate Judiciary Committee? The chairman, right? The chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. In the old days, if a chairman of a Judiciary Committee got a blue slip from a senator, whoosh, that was it. Um, he would not hold what? What does the Senate Judiciary Committee hold? before they submit a nomination to the floor. They hold, starts with an H, hearings. Um, and the other thing is, is a Senate Judiciary Committee, even if they held hearings, would likely send the nomination to the floor of the Senate with at least a disapproval rating based upon the uh, blue slip. So, if you are a president, you had better talk to the senators from your state particularly the senior senator or and, and the senator from your uh, party. And if you don't, well, your nomination is probably going to die in the Senate Judiciary Committee. So it's interesting, it kind of, this kind of turns the nomination process on its head. <laughs> For uh, federal officials in the state where the senator is from, and a district court judge, remember that's the trial court judge, is the quintessential example of that. The senators control the nomination process, not the president. Okay, um, fascinating politics. I know this is getting kind of deep, but A, this is real life, and this is what has happened in the Senate. When they talk about the interactions of the three branches, um, that is going to involve politics, and our politics is the politics of polarization. Now, even though the test is only uh, covering units one, two, and three, if an answer takes you into the direction of talking about what we learned in four and five, which includes parties and party polarization in Congress, then absolutely talk about that, okay? So what has been happening in the Senate? Remember, the Senate is supposed to be the more collegiate, the more deliberative body. Remember the House of Representatives is supposed 
to be closely tied to the people. Why? Think of two factors. Why are they closely tied to the people? Think of their terms. Think of who they represent. Think of how they are elected. They were elected differently than the Senate up until the, what amendment? 17th, all right, until the 17th. Now they're elected the same way. All right. Remember, the House has two-year terms. They're, likely, they're more likely to vote how? Remember our three ways of voting, delegate, trustee, and politico. The House is going to be more con closely connected to the people, probably going to vote, have more pressure to vote delegate. The senators with six-year terms are supposed to be more deliberate, more collegial. Uh, one important aspect of this collegiality was the filibuster rule. Uh, now, if you read this link, it's interesting. In the early days of the Senate, they did not even have the cloture rule. Remember what a, a, a cloture vote is? It terminates a filibuster. How many votes does it require? Correct, 60, right? Now, in the old days, they didn't even have the cloture vote. So you basically, the whole Senate had to just be getting along to get something passed. Or there would be some log rolling where one senator would agree to do something for another senator, right? Remember the term log rolling? Um, <clears throat> Also in the olden days, uh, and then when they invoked the cloture rule, it used to be two-thirds, and now it's down to 60%. Um, but uh, in our increasingly polarized politics um, have manifested itself in the United States Senate, and it manifested itself with the election of President Obama, who took office when? January. 2009, right? Remember the election is in November, the president takes office in on January 3rd, right? January 3rd, and then, no, 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 president, January 20th, Congress, uh, January 3rd. Okay, um, so, President Obama starts nominating uh, judges to the federal bench, and what are the Republicans doing? They're filibustering all of them clogging the whole system. Hundreds of judicial uh, positions vacant because the Republicans are willy-nilly filibustering all uh, um, Obama nominations. Huh, which might mean that the president wasn't honoring what? <laughs> maybe he wasn't honoring senatorial courtesy. Or maybe the senators, if they were Republicans want, ones, just gave him names that he could never appoint, right? Just gave him like arch-conservative people and he's like, no, I, look, you have to work with me. I'm a Democrat. You've got to give me names of moderate people. And may, maybe that was what was happening, right? But, okay, so the Democrats get frustrated. Now remember, under Article 1, I forget where it is, Section 5, whatever, so it's either in section four or five. It says each house, each chamber can, can make the rules for their proceedings. So the filibuster is constitutional in that it is a Senate rule that the Senate made pursuant to Article One. Okay? Now, which means if it's a rule, it can be changed by a simple majority vote in the Senate, which is interesting. So with a simple majority vote, you can change the filibuster rule, which requires 60 votes, all right? And I don't think you can filibuster a rule change, just laws. Or it used to be you could filibuster a law or you could filibuster a nomination. You could filibuster a nomination. In 2013, the Democrats were so frustrated, the Democrats in the Senate and the President were so frustrated, now they had the majority in the Senate, but they couldn't get any nominations through because the Republicans were doing what? Filibustering all of his nominations, or many of his nominations. So, and this was a bold move. Nobody thought this, 
any, either party was going to do this because it was going to erode this long foundation of collegiality and cooperation of, of the Senate being the most deliberate body in the world. Um, and the filibuster was part of that. So the Democrats changed the filibuster rule, no more filibustering nominations, including judges. And, ooh, they were stupid on this, and including cabinet level positions. The only positions that you could still filibuster were Supreme Court justice nominations. That was the rule that the Democrats changed in 2013. Now, what happened? Elections happened. And in, oh, by the way, were they thinking about this? Were they thinking about this? Well, hold off on this, all right? We're going to talk about it in the next slide. Okay, so now what happens? Well, one thing, we have a midterm election in when? 2000, ah, did you get it, 2014? Okay, we had a midterm election in the two, two, uh, 2014, and guess what happened in the midterm? By the way, what happens in midterm elections? Whose uh, coalition fails to show up in midterms? Democrats, right? So, even though Obama was elected again in 2012, in the 2014 midterm, the Republicans took control, shush Sammy, took control of the Senate. Stop. Sam, quiet. All right. Now, when does Obama leave office? He leaves office in November 2016. What? Aye, aye, aye. He doesn't leave office in November 2016. The election is in 2016. He doesn't leave office until January 2017. My slide might be wrong because of that. Okay? All right. So, and then one of the most conservative justices on the Supreme Court, um, Justice Scalia, an original intent guy, an ori originalism, original intent guy, dies suddenly. And now it's Obama has the right to nominate a new justice of the Supreme Court. He nominates a guy named, oh, what was his name? Uh, Merritt Garland. Uh, a moderate, not a crazy liberal, just a moderate, a white guy. Um, he, had, he, had, he had, when he had a Democratic Senate and he was new, uh, the, uh, he had gotten through Elena Kagan and Sotomayor, two Hispanic females. Um, now he goes with a white guy moderate because he's got a Republican Senate. Gee, did the Republican Senate affect his decision? Was he trying to get somebody through? Yes. Now what did the Republicans do? The Republicans basically, and, and who runs the Senate? The Senate majority leader. He runs the place. And he told the Senate Judiciary Committee, don't even schedule hearings, don't even hold hearings on Merrick Garland. We are going to wait. We are going to wait until November. And in November, who knows, we might win the presidency. Now, the Democrats weren't too worried about this because, of course, Clinton... Um, was probably going to win over all of the Republicans that were still running. Trump was still going against the other 16 Republicans at this time, right? But Repu uh, Trump wins the nomination by April 2016. Clinton is in a fight with Bernie all the way to the July convention, um, even though she finally in June wins enough. Well, she couldn't win the nomination without the vote of who? She did not have enough delegates to win over a majority, right, of, of the delegates. So she had to get the vote of the superdelegates at the convention to get her over half. Hold on, I'm going to check my clock because um, these uh, videos only last ah! for... Shush! Sammy, quiet, quiet, go lay down. They only last for 30 minutes.
um, and then I have to start a new one. Okay, so you guys get it? So, the Republicans, boy, is this party politics in the Senate? This is party politics on steroids, right? Because... Apparently, from my research and from what I heard from many news sources, this had never been done before. Never was the Senate, controlled by one party, so bold in stopping a nomination to the Supreme Court by the president of another party. With, with, okay, so that was from February to January. Um, Obama would leave office in January 2017, so it was 11 months. They, they upheld the nomination. The Supreme Court had only eight members for um, 11 months, and that was very controversial. Total party partisan politics. And then what happens? Oh my God, Trump wins, right? Trump wins. <coughs> the Democrats are in shock. What happens in January 17? Trump gets sworn in. He is now our new president. Now, the Democrats back here, the Democrats back here had changed the rule that you can't filibuster even cabinet level positions. So, oh, by the way, the Republicans won the Senate along with Trump, so it's a Republican controlled Senate, and there is the no filibuster rule on Trump's cabinet level positions. So, does Trump have to go compromise? Go pick a more moderate, um, universally accepted cabinet level, uh, cabinet secretary in order to prevent a filibuster? No! He gets to pick radical people like Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, that never would have made it through the Senate without being filibustered uh, by the Democrats, except they had changed the rule back in 2013. Ow! Talking about a decision coming back to bite you. <clears throat> All right. Then what happens? In April uh, 2017, uh, ah, remember that open uh, Supreme Court seat from Scalia? Remember? Scalia died in 2016. Well, Trump gets around to nominating uh, in April. Um, ah, hey, hey, hey. Quiet. Trump gets around to nominating a replacement for Scalia. It goes to the Republican-controlled Senate. And what do they do? They do nuclear option version 2. All right? They do nuclear option version 2. They change the rule that where there is no filibustering period on nominations, even nominations for the Supreme Court. Right. Okay, so then, now, without the threat of a filibuster, if the president and the Senate are controlled by the same party, can they nominate who they want? Hey, guys, shush, shush, come here, come here, shush. Hold on, hold on. All right, you guys get it? So Trump had free reign. He had a Republican Senate. By the way, was he really popular with the Republican voters? Yes. Did Mitch McConnell, the Republican Senate Majority Leader, not have a ton of power? Um, I mean, how much influence did he have? Is he going to, is he going, I, I, look, he's going to have influence with President Trump, but is he going to be able to have a veto on Trump's pick for the Supreme Court? If so, Trump will get on it and start tweeting about it. And then Mitch McConnell will be in deep water and he won't get reelected, right? And he'll become ostracized by the Republican people. So um, Trump nominates Neil Gorsuch. Um, and then later, I forget when, but a year or so later, the moderate Republican appointed but moderate Justice Kennedy. Boy, why was Kennedy a moderate even though he was nominated by a Republican? Because in the old days, the Senate was collegial and had the filibuster rule. And if you, even if you control, even if your party controlled the Senate when you were making a nomination, you still had to include the Democratic senators in the decision-making process 
or they would filibuster. So it was more of a give and take bipartisan process to pick Supreme Court justices. Now the process has gone completely by has gone completely partisan. Boy, tie back to one of our cases. Does this have anything to do with Roe v. Wade? Does this have anything to do with Roe v. Wade? All right, I'm going to stop the tape, and we're going to uh, we're going to um, finish up in just a few more minutes. All right.